and it is my privilege to get to be the pastor of uh, this church, this uh, group of believers who get together, who study the Word of God, who get together and worship together, who get together and try to live life together, growing, learning more about Christ. Now, none of us in here are perfect. In fact, that's one of the things that we always tell people is uh, this is a place where you can come just as you are, but expect God to change you because He is. Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, we're in the Old Testament, which I don't go to very often, so this is kind of unusual for me, but we're going to be in Joshua, and we're going to start in Joshua chapter 1 and then kind of make our way through it, and so Joshua's in the Old Testament, if you guys want to turn over there. Um, last night, I got to watch the movie Big Hero 6. Anybody seen that yet? I'm going to be honest, I was excited about watching it, and I wasn't disappointed. I expected it to be a good movie, and it was a good movie. And if you guys were here last week, you know where I'm going with this, right? But there were other times where I expected the movie to be good. I'll give you an example. Up. I hate that movie. And some of you guys are offended by that, and that's okay. Uh, Disney's Up. I didn't like it. I expected it to be good. Um, you know, it had a dog that was like, whoop, 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 you know, that, and it reminded me of me. And so I thought I'm going to really enjoy this. And I expected it to be a good movie, and I was let down. And last week I preached a sermon on expectation. And when you pray, what do you expect God to do? And, and I think most of you guys got it, because I've heard, I've heard the word expect come out of your guys' mouth this last week a lot. I've heard stories of what God did this week. I've heard incredible testimonies of how God is moving in your lives. But I want to make sure you guys understand this. What's the difference between me expecting up to be good and me expecting Big Hero 6 to be good and I was let down? You know, if I expected it, why didn't it happen? The trick is, is we need to expect God. We need to put our faith in God. And so whenever you put your faith in God, you're never let down, are you? And so, you know, this week we've been praying, God, move the town of Clinton. As I came here almost five years ago now, and uh, I've talked to several of you, and hearing your stories of how God brought you to the town of Clinton is absolutely crazy. I was just visiting with Shirley this morning about how she ended up in Clinton. Some of you guys have similar stories. Very few of you were born in this town, but many of you... God brought you here through extraordinary events. And can I tell you, I believe that God has you here because he wants to use you to change the town of Clinton. And if you were born here, God wants to use you to change the town of Clinton. I think that's part of the purpose of a church. It's to change the community in which they're in. And so that's where this series is born out of. It's born out of this desire to see the over 10,000 people that live in Clinton transformed, not by the church, but by Christ himself. Amen? Amen. You know, Clinton's like a lot of cities. This morning, the busiest place in town, you know where it's going to be? The casino and the gas stations. You know where the busiest place last night was? The bars. J.C. Cowboys and casinos. <coughs> I mean, it's just plain and simple. And if you guys went to those places, guess what? I'm glad you're here this morning. I am. I, I know that sometimes people think, oh, man, the church doesn't want me there because I was there doing this last night. No, we want you here, guys. This is your chance to hear what God wants to do. He's got something great for you this morning. But the thing is, is we gather here this morning not just so that we can have a good time. We gather here because God wants to use us to make a difference in people's lives. And I believe that whenever we put our faith in God, He never lets us down. I might have said that. Have I said that already? When we put our faith in God, He never lets us down. And when you expect God to answer His promises, guess what? He answers His promises. Do you guys believe the promises of God this morning? Because I, I read the newspaper and I believe the newspaper. I read AOL News and for some reason I believe it. And yet sometimes I doubt God's promises. Maybe I'm alone in that. Am I alone in this? But my goodness, we've got something so much better, and sometimes we doubt it. Well, I just want to share a promise with you guys this morning, and I'm going to look at this story in the Old Testament, and it's found in Joshua. So if you've got your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's a Bible in one of the chairs in front of you. If you don't have one for the house, take it with you. Uh, we'd love to give that Bible to you. Write in it, take notes in it, whatever you need to do. Just consider it yours. If you want a better Bible than that, come and talk to me and we'll see what we can do. 
But take that with you. If you've got it on your phone, by all means, get your phone out. I'll just assume that you're reading the Bible even if you're texting, okay? I'm just going to make that assumption. Because I know none of you guys would ever do that. So we're in Joshua. And Joshua is coming on the hills of Moses. And you guys all know the story of Moses. He brings the people out of Egypt. They've been in slavery. The Israelites have been in slavery for all these years. He brings them out of Egypt. It's called the Exodus. And he takes them out, and what should have taken just about a six-month journey turns into a 40-year trip in the desert, going around and around in circles, always complaining, always wanting more. It sounds a lot like my kids. It sounds a lot like me and my wife sometimes. We just we get in a rut and go around, and we're looking for God in his the whole time. But they're going around and around, and finally they get to the place where they're ready to go into the land that God has promised them. You guys might recognize this story from Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments. They go around in the desert. But what you don't see in that movie is the rest of the story. You guys remember Paul Harvey, the rest of the story? Well, this is the rest of the story because what happens is Moses doesn't get to take them into the promised land. But it's called the promised land for a reason. God had promised the people, you're going to be here. You're going to be safe. You're going to be in my presence. You're going to be in this land. And so he allows Joshua to take them the rest of the way. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's look at Joshua real quick. Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to go from Joshua chapter 1 to chapter 6. I encourage you guys to read what's in between, but this is where we're going to start. It says in Joshua 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is a, Moses, my servant, is dead. That's a good way to break it to somebody. He did. Moving on. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them, to the Israelites. In verse 3, we see the promise. It says, and I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Every place that you're going to walk. This is the land I have promised you. I'm going to give it to you. It goes on in verse 4. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I just want to read this. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many of you guys cling to that promise? I, I just need to know. How many of you guys, man, you cling to the fact that God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's a promise that we all hold on to. Every church agrees on that promise of God. But you know, there's a promise before that. It was a promise made to Moses that then was turned around and made to Joshua. And what I want to tell you is that promise was not just for them because every promise in the Old Testament was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so through this promise and through Jesus Christ, we have this promise. When in verse 3 it says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Can I tell you, God has promised us Clint. How can I say that? How can I say that? He told the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of every nation. Can I tell you, when he said that, he had Clint in mind too. Amen? When he said, go and make disciples of every nation, he meant your nation of Clinton, America. He made your nation, your people. He made your nation, your family, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He told Joshua, just as I promised Moses, you will take the land. Can I tell you this morning, God has promised us that he will take this city. Amen. Dear Holy Father, God, as we study your word today, Lord, we don't want to just have church, God. We don't want to just have a service. We don't want to just be in a place. We want to be a people, God. That's hearts are on fire to see you move and to see you do something powerful, God. Lord, you're eagerly anticipating the time when people turn back to you. And God, we are in that time now. Lord, move this place in a way that only you can move us. Open up our hearts. Use your Holy Spirit and use your word to teach us. It's in your precious Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now guys, in, a, in Joshua 1, we learned that God promised this land to them. Just the same way that God has promised us the city of Clinton. There's some things that had to happen first before they could take this land. And so in Joshua 2, 3, 4, and 5, what you see is some wavering. 
You see God's people saying, I'm not sure we can do this. I know all about that. Do you know how many times I doubted what God would prom promise me in his word? you know how many times I doubt that? I mean, it's just too big for you, God. And don't I look stupid every time I doubt God? You guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? I mean, when you doubt God, who looks stupid? You or God? <laughs> we do. Absolutely. And so what happens is they kind of go through this time of wavering. And they just don't think they can do it. And then we come to Joshua chapter 6. So if you guys have your Bibles, Joshua chapter 6 is where we're going to settle for a while here. Joshua chapter 6. And so the question is, is if God has promised us to take this city, how do we take this city? How do we take back Clinton for Jesus Christ? How do we do it? How are we going to do it? Well, we're going to find out. Because there's a story in the scriptures where a land is taken, where a city is taken. It was supposed to be impossible for it to happen. And yet, through God's instruction, it happens. Through God's help, it happens. Can I tell you that whenever I moved here to Clinton, do you know what people told me? I was an idiot. And that was actually putting it in PG. I won't say the words that people actually used to me. They had some abbreviations for it, some acronyms for it. They had some words for me. They told me that I was a bad husband to take my wife there, not a bad father to take my kids there. And some of you guys might be offended by that. That might offend you. I hope it does. But can I tell you that most of the world looks on at Clinton and says, it'll never change. Can I tell you, God doesn't look at Clinton that way. He doesn't look at you that way, and he doesn't look at the town of Clinton that way. He says, I can redeem anyone I choose. And can I tell you, if he can redeem somebody like me, if he can save somebody like me, he can sure do it to a whole town of Clinton. Amen? Amen. And so what we're going to see is in Joshua chapter 6, we're going to see what has to happen, what God does to see a city changed. And so to take this city, here's the first thing that has to happen. Walls must fall. Walls must fall. If you have your Bible, Joshua 6.1. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. This town of Jericho was a powerhouse of a city. It was a impenetrable fortress. And whenever it came time for the Israelites to take the land that God had promised them, it was the first city they came to. It was pretty much the gate into it. And it had walls that were supposed to be impossible to get through. And so it says that they were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And it's because of the, the threat of the Jewish people, the threat of the Israelites, that they had it shut up completely. No one could come in, no one come come out. That means that they weren't willing to talk negotiations, they weren't willing to talk peace. They had one thing in mind. I'm going to hide out behind these walls. We do that, don't we? We hide behind our little walls sometimes. Verse 2, then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. Notice the word that the Lord uses here. He doesn't say, I will deliver. He doesn't say, it's going to happen. What does he say? It has already happened. I've already done it. I've done the hard work. All you've got to do is the easy part. Can I tell you guys, God has done the hard work. We think it's a hard job. Because we want to do the hard work. Jesus said, I will take the hard work on the cross when I go to the cross for you. The Lord said, I have delivered the city to you. It's already happened. It goes on to say, verse 3, March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. The wall of Jericho, the Jericho city, the city of Jericho, it had some walls, didn't it? Can we just admit something? Clinton has some walls. I mean, Clinton has some barriers that need to come down. There are some serious walls that we have built up and that the city has built up and that the people have built up that need to come crashing down. What am I talking about? Can I make you uncomfortable? Can I talk about the racism in this town? The walls of race need to come down in Clinton. Amen. The walls of Hatred because of where you come from in which neighborhood you live in need to come down. The wall needs to come down. I 
couldn't believe it when I moved here. And I saw on 20th Street that big old fence. Because I knew what it meant. It meant segregation. You can call it what you want. But it meant segregation. I see it whenever I see the schools. I can walk by and I see the groups hanging out. The Mexicans over here, the whites over here, and the Indians over here, and the blacks over here. And then you've got a few that kind of go in between. But it's still segregated. Why? Because we still have a racist heart. The walls have got to come down. How about this? Let, let me hit a little more home because maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe you agree that that needs to change because your heart has already changed. But what about this? The walls between the churches have to come down. I don't care if you're Methodist. I don't care if you're Baptist. I don't care if your church is non-denominational. If you preach Jesus Christ crucified is the only way to salvation, we are brothers and sisters. No matter your skin color, no matter your accent, no matter what language you speak, no matter your social income, guess what? If your Savior is Jesus Christ, you're my brother or you're my sister, and I would die for you. Walls have got to come down. You want to see... Jesus Christ, take this city. The walls have got to come down. I've got to tell you, I've seen walls coming down. I've seen them coming down in this church, amen? amen. There's been change. And it's not the look of the building. We as a people, we are changing, amen? amen. And it's not because we're trying harder. It's because Jesus Christ is changing us from the inside out. That's right. But can I tell you, we got to do better. Because here's the thing. It's easy for us to talk about their walls need to come down and their walls need to come down. But can I tell you something? Can I tell you something right now? You've got walls in your heart right now. You've got barriers that you've put up. You've got some sin in your life. You've got some hatred in your life. You've got some things that you're just not willing to do for God. And some walls need to come down because listen, church, and listen good. Listen, Custer Avenue Baptist Church. Before the walls of Clinton come down, the walls of our hearts must come down. And before the walls of this church come down, the walls on your hearts must be broken and shattered. And only Jesus Christ can do that for you. Amen? Amen. The walls down. If we want to see God take this city, the walls must come down. So let me ask you something. How do walls come down? How do walls come down? Well, I'll tell you the answer. And it may not be what you think. Some people will think, well, we got to fight harder. We got to have more petitions. We got to have more special programs and more special services. We've got to have candlelight services, we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to change the policies and procedures at the schools, and, and we've got to take it by force. But here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the walls come down. By faith and not by force. Let me say it again. By faith and not by force, the walls will come down. By faith, the walls in your hearts will come down. By faith, the walls of this church will come down. By faith, the walls of the church will come down. And by faith, the walls in Clinton will be crumbled. Amen? Amen. It's by faith, not by force. It's by love and not by the law. It's not by forcing people to do stuff. It's not by throwing more rules and more regulations. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's by the love for other people that we will see walls come down. Amen? And here's what I know. In the scriptures we're told that it's by grace we are saved through faith. It's by faith the walls came down so that you could have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But in James we're told that faith without works is dead. So here's the next thing I want you to know. Your faith needs to produce obedience. You see, obedience is the evidence of your faith. If we want the walls to come down, here's the next thing that happened. His people must obey. Keep following along in Joshua chapter 6. We're going to skip up to verse 15. The Lord has given these instructions, and then Moses passes these instructions. And this is what it says starting in verse 15. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. 
Except on that day, and this is the seventh day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And you know what the people did? They said, ah, I don't look silly. Ah, I'm not in junior high anymore. I don't shout. Ah, we're, we're Baptists. We don't do that. You know what they did? They shouted because the Lord had given them the city. I'm not going to ask you to shout, but can you give me an amen this morning? Amen. Can I get a little bit louder? Amen! amen! Guys, I believe that God wants to take this city. And if we just sit around and talk about how God's going to take the city, if we just sit around and complain about how God hasn't taken the city, when He's given us specific instructions to go and make disciples, no wonder He's not going to take the city. Because we've got to have faith. And then guess what? We're going to have obedience. When His people obey, He's going to take this city. Amen? Yeah. I'm ready for that. So what are you not obeying right now? What is it that God has told you to do that you kind of just gave Him a finger and said, no, thank you. Turn the other direction. Maybe you just politely said, hmm, maybe that wasn't really God. Maybe that was just the emotion of the sermon. I'm not sure. But I know that when God told the Israelites to march around a city, they marched. When He told them on the seventh day to march seven times around, they marched seven times. When He told them to blow the trumpet horns, guess what? They blew the trumpet horns. And when He told them to shout by God, they shouted. Because when His people obey, He will take the city. I love that. I love that. Whenever the verse ends and it says, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. It wasn't shout so the Lord will give it to you, but he's already given it to you. Be obedient. And here's the last thing. If we want to see God take this city, our love must overcome our apathy. Let me say it again. Our love must overcome our apathy. Maybe I could say it another one. Wait, our action must overcome our laziness. Our love for the Lord, our love for the lost people must overcome our wanting to just sit around and do nothing and watch everybody else do it. Our love for not wanting people to go to hell must outweigh our love of watching TV. Maybe I can put it this way to you. Our love for God and people must outweigh our love of ourselves. Amen. Man, we are sick because we love ourselves so much. I mean, we might as well get an anniversary date. We love each other so much, right? Amen. We love ourselves so much. I'm going to buy myself a present because this was the day I fell in love with myself. Guess what, guys? It will not happen till our love for others overcomes our apathy. Quit not caring. And I know it's a double negative, but it works there. Quit your not caring. Quit your not loving. Because eternity is too daggone important. Amen? Amen. Amen. Eternity is too important to just shut up and say nothing. Eternity is too important to not offer up your house. Eternity is too important to not go across the street to talk to your neighbor. And I'm preaching to myself here, guys, but I'm also preaching to you, I have a feeling. Do you guys want God to take this city? Are you sure? Because I'm not sure. I'm not sure I felt that. Yes. Do you want God to take this city? Yes. Yeah. Guess what, guys? <coughs> he used a group of people walking around a city seven times. For seven days, they walked around once. And the seventh day, they walked seven days. And then they blew a trump. And, and let me tell you, if God can do that with people who walk around the city and blow a trumpet, don't you dare tell me that he won't do it when a group of over 100 people get together and decide, I'm going to love people and love God more than I love myself. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a scripture that I used to really love but as I've gotten older, it's come to be a sore spot for me. Romans 14, 11 says, As it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, 
every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will acknowledge God. And I used to love that verse because it meant one day everybody will acknowledge God. But then as I've gotten older, I've realized something. It doesn't say when they'll acknowledge God. Yeah, everybody's going to acknowledge God, but for some it's going to be too late. And what it's done now is spur me on to this. It spurred me to love more. It spurred me to action. Let me read it again. And this time I want you to think about your family member. I want you to think about your neighbor. I want you to think about your teachers, your bosses, your co-workers, your kids. One day, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. One day. What day do you want it to be? Do you want it to be now or the day of judgment? Let this spur you on to love. And let love spur you into action. Because listen what happens in Joshua 6. Verse 20, it says, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. And it doesn't say they sat around talking about what a good job they did. It says this in verse 20. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Till his Father God, spur us on to charge this city. Spur us on to action and love that takes this city, God. Let us not be complacent with our happy places. God, break our hearts for the lost. Break our hearts for the hurting. God, break our hearts for the sin in our lives. God, take this city back for you. And God, we eagerly anticipate what you will do. God, we eagerly anticipate your, the day that you're going to bring everyone back to you. God, and I believe that this town will be transformed because you're tearing down walls at this very moment.